Welcome to Madame Ravens. This way to the library. She's been expecting you. We had to make up scary stories to tell in class, but one stood out from the rest. By Sam Haysom. Back when I was in primary school, we had a teacher that everyone hated. Mr. Hanscom, his name was. He taught us English. Mr. Hanscom was probably about five foot five, with a ratty face and thick glasses. Fat little pot belly, losing his hair on top. Pretty much every genetic disadvantage you could think of all rolled into one jerk. Freak, I hated him. I don't know if the power of being taller than 30 other human beings in one classroom went to the guy's head, but he treated us more like we were his prisoners than his English students. He yelled and screamed at kids. He humiliated them. He'd put you in detention for anything he could think of. He was a nasty, nasty piece of work. He had his favorites, too. Not kids he liked, but kids he particularly liked to pick on. There was an overweight boy called John Pritchard, for instance, and every time Hanscom took the register, he'd call him Pig Arse and acted like it was a big mistake. I always made him read the part of Piggy when we studied Lord of the Flies. Then there was a girl called Mary Richards, who had a lisp. Whenever there was no volunteers to read out loud, he'd make Mary do it every time. But the kid he loved picking on the most was Grant. Grant was a new kid who joined us at the start of our year six. Mum told me he was a traveler which meant he moved to lots of different places and lived in a caravan. Other kids at school had different names for him, but they never had said them to Grant's face. The kid was about a head taller than the rest of us, for one. Big-boned and broad, he had this steely don't-f-with-me look about him that meant the other kids left him well alone. <laughs> It didn't stop Mr. Hanscom, though. Not one bit. I don't know whether it was because Grant was almost as tall as he was, or because Grant's family were travelers. But Hanscom had marked him from day one. He hated Grant. You could hear it in his voice. Every time he spoke to him, he did not like the kid one bit. Mr. Hanscom alternated between telling Grant off in front of everyone. This could be for literally anything, like sneezing while Hanscom was talking or having his shirt untucked and trying his best to embarrass the kid. The first week had Grant coming up in front of the class. Then he berated him for ten minutes because his shoes weren't properly polished. Another time he told us we were going to practice synonyms. Then he wrote the word different in the middle of the blackboard. We had to take turns going up and writing words around it that meant something similar. When we were done, Mr. Hanscom gave a thin smile. Now we need someone well-versed in this subject to volunteer to read. All these words out loud to the class, he said. How about you, Grant? I think he'd been expecting Grant to be a slow reader, but he was wrong. The kid might have looked like a thug, but boy, could he read. He rattled through those words with no problems at all, never giving any hint that the subject matter affected him. I could see Hanscom's smile slowly turning into a scowl 
the longer it went on. Things carried on in the same vein for most of the autumn term. Hanscom needling, and Grant putting up with it as best he could. Then, come October, we had a special assignment. One for Halloween. The idea was to go away and write a scary story, so we could take turns reading them out loud in the class on October 31st. I don't remember many of the stories the other kids told that day. I barely even remember my own. I think it was something pretty generic about a monster in the cupboard of my room. But I remember Grant's. Even all these years later, I still remember it. The story Grant told was sort of a folk tale, and it had me hooked from the moment he began. Here it is, in Grant's words, as best as I can remember. Once upon a time, there was a family of witches who lived in a cave. The witches kept to themselves, and most of the people and creatures in the nearby village left them well alone. But there was one exception. A large, ugly troll terrorized the woods surrounding the village. The troll was eight feet tall, with a big green belly the size of a boulder. Hideous red boils and warts covered his face. He ate anything that was foolish enough to get in his way. Now the troll thought he owned the woods, and he didn't like the fact the witches were living in a cave so close to them. He didn't like it at all. But there wasn't much he could do about it. Whenever he'd seen the witches, he'd given chase, but they'd always run back into the safety of their cave. They'd crawl back into the darkness between the rocks, and the droll was too big to follow them. He'd stand at the mouth of the cave, and he'd bellow the same thing each day. Witches hiding in the cracks. Leave this land and don't come back. If you refuse and choose to stay, know that I will make you pay. Now the witches were afraid of the troll. Everyone was. But they didn't have anywhere else to go. So for a long time, they survived as best they could. They'd sneak out of the cave to get food and fetch the items they used to brew their spells. Whenever the troll was out of sight, and whenever they saw him, they'd run back into the darkness. The troll was never smart enough to catch them, and he got angrier and angrier. Soon he started killing animals and leaving them to rot in the mouth of the cave. Soon he started killing animals and leaving them to rot in the mouth of the cave. Badges, foxes, birds. One day he even caught a child from the nearby village and left his tiny broken body in the cave's entrance. When the witches came out the next day and saw this, they were horrified but they also spotted something else. Something the troll would never have noticed. Stuck amongst the blood and broken remains of the child body was one thick black hair. A hair from the head of the troll. And when the witches saw this, they finally knew what to do. They took the hair and they gathered up some of the twigs from the forest, and they wove it all together into a miniature wooden doll. They made it tall and fat and ugly, so that it looked as much like the troll as possible. 
Then they gather round it in a circle to cast their spell. And when they were finished with their magic, they got the doll and took turns sticking pins in it. Pin after pin after pin. By the time they were finished, the thing had over one hundred sharp sticks of metal peppering its wooden body. The next day, there was no dead animal outside their cave. There was no sign of the troll at all. The witches looked for it in the forest, and soon enough, they found some black troll's blood staining some nearby ferns by the river. They followed the trail. The blood got thicker the further they went along, and the stains grew more and more frequent, fresher. Finally, in a clearing, not far from the village, they found the troll itself. It was slumped in the shade of a giant oak tree, eyes closed, pulling in shallow breath after shallow breath and it was bleeding from a hundred tiny mouths that had been carved into its green flesh, its black blood leeching out of it in the most slow and painful way imaginable. I remember Mr. Hanscombe stopping the story at this point. He had a familiar scowl on his face as he gestured for the class to be silent. You could tell everyone had been into the story because of a bunch of kids groaned when Hanscombe put a stop to it. Yes, yes, okay, he said, holding his hands up for quiet. I think we've heard quite enough, Grant. That was predictably unpleasant. I suppose you can take the boy out of the caravan, but you can never quite take the caravan out of the boy. That wasn't the last day I saw Grant, but it must have been close. He left our school a couple of weeks later. Family moved away. I heard they went further south, but no one really knew for sure. All we knew was that one day Grant was in lessons, and the next his chair was empty. Gone, just like that. And a few days later... So was Mr. Hanscom. It started when a supply teacher appeared one morning to take his English class. We didn't think much of it at the time, just assumed he was sick or something. That was until we saw the front page of the next day's newspaper. We never found out all the details. There was a talk from the headmaster and whispers in the playground, sure, but mainly just a lot of rumors. No one knew quite what to believe. The one thing everyone could agree on was that Mr. Hanscom had been murdered. The police had no leads, and the details of his death were apparently too grim for the paper to print. I don't know what it was that drove me to go looking for the spot where Grant's family had been camping. Simple curiosity, perhaps. Maybe the fact I couldn't quite shake the memory of the story he told. Whatever it was, I spent the weeks after Hanscombe's murder riding my bike around the local countryside after school and at weekends trying to track down their old campsite. And eventually, I found it. It was a man who worked in a newsagent on the edge of the nearby village that gave me the tip, pointing me in the direction of some fields along the forest, said the travelers had been staying somewhere over that way. It didn't take me long to find the right field after that. It was close to the edge of the woods, not that far from a river. Reminded me a bit of the setting in the story Grant had told. Just swapped the cave for a field. I set my bike down and began looking around. Grant's family had been gone a few weeks by then. 
but the signs were still there. Flattened patches of grass, a couple of rusted metal chairs, cigarette butts, and, in what I might have guessed, to have been the middle of their campsite, a stone circle. I don't know why, but I had a funny feeling in my stomach as I approached that circle. Butterflies, I suppose. Maybe a little fear. The stone circle was empty, but for one thing in the middle, a tiny shape propped up against a rock. I think my mind knew what I was going to see a second before I got close enough to make it out in detail. I drew in a sharp breath. The object leaning against the rock was a doll. Wooden, painted, carved out of some nearby tree was my guess. The doll was small, but it had been decorated with careful detail. A little pot belly, thinning hair. I recognized Mr. Hanscom almost immediately. There was only one thing different. Only one thing that separated the likeness of the doll from the image of Mr. Hanscombe that had appeared in the local paper. Something subtly wrong with the face. I leaned closer to get a better look and felt a wave of nausea roll through my stomach. Both the doll's eyes had been gouged out. So quoth this raven. My thanks to Sam Haysom for allowing me to read his lovely story. Shades of Lovecraft and the Cats of Ulster there for you. Wonderful story. Thank you so much, my darlings, for coming to listen. And special thanks to my Patreon supporters, Ermin Case. Darren and Jennifer, and Laura. If you like this, please hit the little button to let me know. If you didn't, hit the little button to let me know. Leave a comment. I'm always glad to talk with you, my darlings. I'm open to suggestions and criticisms, critiques. If you have not subscribed, please do so and ring the little bell so you know when to come up and see me. And I will talk to you next time, my darlings. <laughs> Farewell. <laughs>